We're going to conclude the Old Testament version of Epic today. So thus far the entire year, we've been studying the Old Testament and we mark a major transition today as we begin to enter into the New Testament. So get ahead, read Matthew as she said, be ready for next weekend. That way when you come, you'll be fully ready for what God wants to say to you. If you don't have a Bible with you physically today, I want to encourage you to watch on the screens or download the Journey Church app that can be found at our website. Go ahead and load it on your phone, and then you can follow along with us. That way, if you miss a message as well, you can pick it up online afterwards. Would you put your hands together one more time and welcome those who are online? God bless you guys. Thank you so much for worshiping with us. So today, as Rob insinuated a little bit earlier, we get to preach from the Italian prophet of the Bible, Malachi. Come on, we're going to preach from Malachi. We're going to preach from the old Italian prophet You know, in all seriousness, um, we're closing out the Old Testament. God is about to go silent in his speech through the prophets for 400 plus years until Jesus returns. What would be the last subject matter that he would deal with? What does he want to deal with in people's hearts? What does he want to deal with in the priest's hearts as well as in our hearts? That's what the book of Malachi is all about. So we're going to study that today. And the subject that he addresses is none other than money. Man, how many of you, as you think about it, money is generally a struggle. You don't have to raise your hands. It's tough, right? It's something that no matter whether, no matter how much money you make, it can be a difficult thing. And that's what we're going to study today, how God views money and how it relates to us. And I'm praying that God would use it to uh, reveal some new things to us because uh, I truly believe that the subject material that he's talking about is as relevant to us today as it was to them in that day. There's a lot of warnings in Scripture but there's also always a path to redemption in scripture. God always leaves us with a measure of hope and he does no different in today's message as well. And one thing that I've noticed is sadly the path to sin is often paved through the way in which we view money. I think it's a reality, right? It reveals a lot about us and how we view God and do we trust God. And that's the kind of subject material we are going to dive into today. Father, I come before you as we dive into what many deem as a sensitive subject, but I do so with great excitement in my heart. Father, as we're going to see you address first the pastors and the priests and what they're living and how they're living as well as what they're teaching. And Father, I felt a measure of conviction in it as I studied your word this week. And Father, I believe you're going to use this to bring some great change. I believe this will be a watershed moment, a moment of destiny for the people of Journey Church where you're going to change perceptions. You're going to change our thinking. You're going to lead us into a new way of walking out how we save, how we give, and how we spend our money. And Father, I ask you to move in our hearts where repentance is needed, would you bring us to a place of repentance? Where rejoicing is needed, let us rejoice. For those in this room who feel like there is no hope in this area of their life, may they leave here inspired, may they leave here encouraged, may they leave here knowing that you've got their back, that you love them dearly, you care for every detail of their lives. Would they sense that in this place this morning? Would your Holy Spirit touch and change them in Jesus' name? And everybody says... Amen. So I have so much material today. I don't know what I'm going to drop or if I'm going to get through it all because God was just stirring on my heart as I was studying this particular subject. And man, it's something that I truly believe influences and impacts us all. It's an area of stress for most of us, as I indicated earlier. And I love God's heart as, you know, when we preach on this subject, it's easy as Rob did earlier. You know, we often as pastors, as leaders, we go straight from Malachi chapter three. Hey guys, you've got to give. We tell you what you should do. Guess what? You know what you should do, don't you? Not just in the area of giving, but come on, like you take an area like I deal with a lot of times like diet. You know what the solution is, right? If you want to lose weight, you got to eat right and you got to exercise more, right? But that's pretty simple instructions, is it not? But how many of us get it on a regular basis? Come on, be, you know, be honest with ourselves, right? Finances are really the same way. There's not too much about it. There's three things, right? 
how you spend money, how you save money, and how you give money. There's only three things. There's nothing else other than that. And God, in his word, first off, addresses and goes after the pastors. It's easy for me as a pastor to go after Malachi chapter 3, but do I read Malachi chapter 1 first? Maybe people are not living out their finances in a biblical way because us as pastors at times are not teaching us. We do a lot of telling you what to do, do we not? We tell you what you already know, but we don't teach you. And I think today's going to be a watershed moment of how we begin to teach people how to get out of debt. Because how do you tithe if you're struggling to make every end meet, right? But it doesn't have to be that way forever. There's hope. If you apply the principles in God's word, I heard testimony after testimony this very week. I've heard testimony after testimony in our own congregation of people who seemingly were at a place where they never thought they were going to be able to get out of debt, never thought they would have freedom in this area of their life, and now today do. That could be you. That could be you, right? You don't have to live under that kind of stress forever. But let me dive into God's word. He first goes after the, prom- the pastor's. And he gives us what I'll deem our final set of Old Testament conditional promises. We've gone over that time and time again throughout the course of the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 1, verse 6. As a son honors his father and a servant his master, if then I am father, where is my honor? And if I am master, where is my fear, says the Lord of hosts? O priests who despise my name, strong words. But you say, how do we despise your name? God's saying, and he's bringing up an issue that's just as relevant in our own generation, not just as it pertains to money, but as all things in life. The standard, frankly, should be the same for a pastor and a priest as for any Bible-believing Christian. All of us should behave in the same way. So we're all in the same boat as we begin to dive into Scripture. He's saying, where's my honor? Where's the fear in our generation, right? We don't fear God anymore. We do crazy stuff. We don't fear him. we got to remember that side of the Lord, too. That's what he's telling us. This is the last things they shared before he goes silent for 400 years, right? These things are utterly important, and first and foremost, and rightly so, he goes after the teachers in that day. He goes after the pastors. He's calling them out. First and foremost, pastors are human beings. We are no different from anybody else, right? Don't put us on a pedestal. We make mistakes, not just in the area of finances, in every single area of life. Hopefully we don't make them um, in such a way that disqualifies us from ministry, but we've seen that sadly time and time and time again in my generation over and over again from the 1980s when I was but a young buck. I didn't, wasn't even a Christian, but it was all over the news. How many of you are old enough to remember Jimmy Swaggart and Jim Baker, right? Come on, right? Y'all still laughing as you hear those names. You remember those names. Most recently, there was a guy in Christianity that many of us looked up to for many years. His name was Bill Hybels. And Bill had a church called Willow Creek Church that became influential globally. And then he fell in sin. And it's coming out time and time again. It's not just delegated to um, Protestant Christianity, but the Catholic Church um, just came out with a big scandal where there was hundreds of children who were abused at the hands of priests. And they did all they did was cover it up. It's not only in Christian life either, but we've grown to accept these things as if they're normal, but they should not be, right? You know, think think about it even. Okay, we all praise President Trump. Yes, there's good things that he's doing. Yes, there's bad things. This guy goes out and he has a child. And at the same time, his kid's like maybe six months old. And he goes and he's paying off Playboy bunnies and porn stars to shut them up. No politician is your savior pastors are not your saviors. Jesus Christ is your savior. Don't look to them for redemption. Don't look to them. Hope and change comes from Jesus. That's hope you can believe in. Come on, Lord. Oh, I'm in trouble now. Ooh. Oh, I got some great, man, I did watch some videos this this past couple of weeks trying to put some, I'm having to cut most of them out. Maybe I'll be shameless and post some later on Facebook, but I'm going to post this first one. You know, he's going after the pastors, right? So I'm going to call some out today. So there's guys like Kenneth Copeland, Jesse DePlantis, Creflo Dollar, many of their televangelists. Just watch this one short video clip. You be the judge. I won't judge it. Go ahead and play the first one.
<laughs> but first, before I read the scripture, Amos chapter six, Brother Copeland, I was flying home from a meeting and I had come out of a glorious meeting. I had just been me and Cruffalo Dollar were preaching, had a glorious meeting. So I was, for lack of a better way to say it, I was spiritually high. I said, people yeah. were saved, touched and blessed. Got in the plane that God so graciously gave us. We're flying home. As I was going home, the Lord real quickly, he said, Jesse, do you like your plane? Now, you know, I thought that's an odd statement. He gave, I said, well, certainly, Lord. He said, do you really like it? And I thought, well, yes, Lord. He said, then he said this. So that's it. I didn't know how to handle it. For me. I went, what? He said, you're going to let your faith stagnate. And when he said that, that shocked me. I went, whoa, wait. I literally unbuckled my seatbelt, my plane. I stood up. My pilots looked right and said, do you need something? I said, no, no, I'm talking to God right now. And he, just, <laughs> and he went back to flying. I said, Lord, I don't think I was letting my faith stagnate. He said, so this is all I could ever do. I said, you want, you, you're trying to tell me something. He said, go to the book of Amos. So if you had the book of Amos, I want to read may, the scripture. May I interrupt right you yes, sir. For a second? Mm -hmm. You couldn't have done that on an airliner. No, sir. No way. Stand up and say, what'd you say, Lord? No. Okay. No. Yeah. And the guy sitting over there saying, what the hell does he think he's doing? <laughs> you can't do you that. You can't do that. No, no. That, this, this is so important. And those of you that are, that are just now coming into these things, um, in, in the first place, Jesse and, 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 and I and, and others, Keith Moore and Creflo and all of us, they, the world is in such a shape. We can't get there without this. That's right. We've got to have this. To we would yeah, have says, the one, mesh that the airlines are in. Dollar plane. Don't y'all need one of those? I mean, come on, Jesus. Like, but did you start to hear his heart of what he was saying? He goes, we can't do this. We can't fly with y'all regular folk. And Kenneth Copeland, the guy who's actually on the left, he is the richest pastor from church money on America. The guy is worth $450 million. He makes Joel Osteen look like a pauper at a mere 40 million. Come on, Jesus, right? He goes on to say there, we can't go on those planes and fly public because we'd be caught in a tube of demons with people like you and I. They want to save people, but they want to go hang out. You know, they won't hang out with us. We are a tube of demons that they would be trapped with. If you're giving your money to them, I'm telling you right now, stop. Stop. That's insanity. I mean, that's insanity. It went on. There was another video that I don't have time to show you, but there's another church where the pastor's driving up in a Bentley. Come on, Jesus, right? Pastor's, dri pastor's driving up in a Bentley, and he's going in the congregation. He's like, you all need to give $1,000. You need to give $1,000, and if you don't got $1,000, then you need to give $300. And if you don't have it, we've got an ATM in the back, and you can go get it out right now. Like, And he's driving up in a Bentley, but that's not necessarily the most offensive part. It was in an impoverished neighborhood with everybody around them completely impoverished. Some of this is insanity. This is the stuff that he's talking about here in Scripture that we're going to see. He goes after them. He calls them out. He tells them it shouldn't be that way. Some of this stuff is absolutely crazy. One person's excited. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. It's not a white problem. It's not a black problem. It's a sin problem. It's an everywhere problem. Malik, so he goes on to share. Malachi 1.7. By offering polluted food on my altar, but you say, how have we polluted you? By saying that the Lord's table may de be despised. When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present, present that to your governor. Will he accept it and show you favor, says the Lord of hosts? Well, today, aren't you glad we're not like bringing chickens and goats and stuff in here? Hey, thank you. First of all, thank God, right? But the point is, he's saying they're giving him the worst. They're giving him the leftovers. They're going and they're not giving him their first and their best. They're, they're giving him what's left over. He says, go try that on the IRS and see what they say, right? Man, I watched another video about a guy before the IRS. I'll have to post that one later because it's absolutely astonishing. Then he gives them a conditional promise. Malachi chapter 2, starting in verse 1. And now, O priests, this command is for you. If you will not listen, if you will not take your heart to give honor to my name, says the Lord of hosts, then I will send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Indeed, I have already cursed them, because you do not lay it to heart. He's telling them, repent. Turn from your ways. 
do life differently. And he goes on to say in Malachi 2.7, For the lips of a priest should guard knowledge, and people should seek instruction from his mouth, and rightly so, for he is the messenger of the Lord's host. But you have turned aside from the way. You have caused many to stumble by your instruction. He's not teaching them how to give. In fact, they were setting an awful example. I want you to know we feel the weight of this subject here at Journey Church. We want to try to live in such a way that we can inspire you through the way that we live. We want to live biblically with our finances. I'll give you a little bit more information about that in a moment. But I personally feel the weight of this. And when I read that word instruction, and I know it's God's timing. I went to a Dave Ramsey uh, momentum class this same week. I had already begun to prepare my message. It was God speaking through these various avenues. When I read that, that word instruction, I came to that realization that while we have not been sinning in that way per se, I've done an incredibly poor job of just falling in line with the general instruction that teachers have given biblically, right? Because the world floods us with misinformation. The government itself goes into debt continually, does it not? We all know about this. They, they do all kinds of crazy things. Our teachers, the, you know, from the day, the whole world is set against us. I had that one message where I talked about it financially. You get out of high school, you get ready to go to college or trade school, they start sending you credit cards, right? They want to enslave you. They want to put you in debt. And we all fall into it. Not all of us, but many of us fall into that. We fall into the systems of the world. And as a church, all we've been doing is telling you to tithe. Is that part of the solution? Yes, it is. It is right. It is good. There is nothing wrong with telling that part of the message. But if we don't teach you how to get out of debt, if we don't teach you how to spend less and save more, then come on, how are we ever going to do it if we're all enslaved? I posted on Facebook a little poll informally just to feel it out, and it says over 45% of the people in this congregation who responded to that don't even have $1,000 in their bank account. If an emergency comes up, tithe, come on, give me more, give me that thousand dollars. They don't how you go asking people for a thousand dollars, they don't even have a thousand dollars. Does that make any sense to you? So from this day forward, we're gonna start changing the way that we do our tithes and our offerings time. We're not going to just tell you. We're going to try to teach you ways to save, teach you ways to get out of debt, teach you ways to live differently. It's still your job to apply it. You still got to apply it. But if you do, you will have freedom. You'll be set free. How amazing would it be to be debt free? How amazing would it be to not have to pay a mortgage? How amazing would it be to not pay for stuff that's in the past and be ready to look for the future? How many of you are paying for stuff you don't even have anymore? It's in the garbage bin already. Y'all laugh, but it's true. You're trying to laugh it off because you feel that sting at the same time, right? You don't have to make those kinds of decisions anymore. Thank you, Jesus, right? So we're going to change the way that we're doing things. We've only presented you with half the story. We need to do different. So when we get stung by God, we need to make corrections too, right? Isn't that what he's asking us to do? He's saying, repent, change, do something different. Give God a little glory for that because I believe it is the word of God for this generation. We can begin to take baby steps to live differently that will ultimately increase our ability to be generous. Because when we say things like tithe, I have no doubt if you're a believer, it's something you want and desire to do. You want to give. You want to be generous. But the world has so enslaved us. May he use today as an opportunity to begin to set us free. And when we're set free in the area of our finances, why is this topic the last one? Why is it so important? Because it affects every other area of life. How many divorces have happened because of mismanagement of money? How many of us feel stress and locked into the job that we hate because we're in debt? If we can affect our finances, then it'll affect every other area of our lives. Amen? Amen. Amen. So we're going to do a shift. We're going to begin to change things. I wanted to give you a little bit of information on the church and me personally, and then I'm going to shift the tables on you. We're going to read Malachi chapter 3 in a little bit more detail, right? Because if I need to repent, then we all need to repent, right? We all need to change. So let me pray just one more time. Father, we are dealing with a sensitive subject, and Lord, would you use it and where a sting needs to sting, sting, but let it do so in such a way that brings real-life transformation. 
Father, we hear the weight of what's already been said to the pastors and the priests. We poked fun at a really sad subject, Lord God, of uh, how do you get to a place where you're asking for money and then calling the very people who are giving it a tube of demons. Lord, help us. Help us to live differently. Lord, I pray right now that this would be a watershed moment for all of us, myself included, that you would impact our hearts and our minds in this area of our life that would change us and transform us and set the people of Journey Church free to live generously, to not have that stress on us, to have the freedom to serve, to have the freedom to give, to have the freedom to just enjoy life free from that bondage and slavery of death. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. So when I was coming up, they had this thing in Christian circles when I started, when I got saved and began to learn about biblical finance, they called it the 80-10-10 rule, and it's changed slightly, but the general rule is this, if you could start at a young age and save 10% of your money, give 10% of your money to God and live off of 80% of your money, then you'd be pretty good when it comes time to retire. That doesn't mean you just retire and go up to the mountains, that means you retire to serve God the rest of your life, right? You get to go do it. So as a church, we try tried to implement that same general principle. The, the ratios are slightly different in the way that we live, but let me tell you a little bit what we do. We give 10% or more right off the get-go, right off the top of what we do. We are faithful to do that. You see many of the recipients of that that we bring on the stage every month and kind of feature them. We try to save 10% of our money for the future to position ourselves for whatever might be around the corner, to begin to position ourselves where one day we might have our own building, that we could be debt-free, and that we don't have any debt, by the way, sorry jumping ahead. Don't want to get anybody wrong here, but um, we use 35% of our money um, for the staffing of the ministry. We use 25% or less for the facilities that we currently are in, and we use 20 plus percent for all other ministry activity, right? Uh, we are 100% debt-free. We want to always be 100% debt-free. We want to live that way. We want to project that. Um, we try to steward every resource that God entrusts us with towards the goal of glorifying Jesus by seeing people get saved and become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. So we want to set the example with how the church uses money. If we go into debt up to our ears to expand the ministry and advance the ministry, how do we coach and teach people how to do differently in their own lives? It just doesn't make sense to us to live that way. So that's first and foremost. I did want to share a couple things personally um, so nobody ever gets anything wrong. I think it's important that we share that. You know, uh, Mary Jo and I got saved at the age of 22 years old. Um, we immediately began to tithe. We took that message to heart. Um, we've had seasons of debt in our early life where we learned lessons. Uh, for most of our life, we carried a mortgage and paid car payments that we had. Um, we worked very hard and trusted God in working very hard. For all of my um, adult life in ministry, I've been bivocational up until one month ago and I still have some work to do in that where um, we'd been grateful. We had a business that we had had for the past 11 years that we just sold. One, We live right now 100% debt-free, praise God. We don't owe a penny on our cars. We don't owe a penny on our house. I can drive in in all confidence in a nice car knowing that I didn't spend a dollar of church money on it. So if you, you know, that, that's important to me. Like, y yes, I have the freedom to go buy the car that I wanted because I tried to steward our finances and God blessed it in the right way. And we can drive up knowing that it's debt free. And I never want that to be a stumbling block for anybody, the way that we've lived or the finances that we have. Um, I think there's more things that we could teach and show by example of how applying God's principle year after year, week after week from that first time where we could only give God $20 and we were excited about it. I mean, it was awesome. We live that way our whole life and our life is a living testament that God's word is true. That if you apply Malachi chapter 3, he will bless you not just in your finances, but with a sense of peace. We can walk in peace. That's the biggest thing that we want for the people of Journey Church. It also gives me the ability to get up here and say stuff that I shouldn't normally say as a pastor, because if you fire me, it don't matter. Come on, Jesus, right? Right. I jokingly say that, but um, we... <laughs> 
I don't say this to brag, but God blessed us so much that we gave our entire salary back last year. Less about that much. I wish it was the entire salary, but it was about this much close to our entire salary last year. And we're on pace to do the same this year. So I work for free. You can fire me. I don't get a paycheck anyways. Come on, Jesus, right? I mean, so we have tried to do that. We want to set the example in the way that we live. And, uh, you know, doesn't mean there haven't been where we had need in our life. There certainly was, but God always met them. We didn't get all of our wants, right? But we always had all of our needs met. God is great. We've lived by the motto, you have to give it away to keep it. So yes, we are trying to live our lives extremely generous as well. We have the freedom to be because we don't have debt enslaving us. We have the freedom to be generous. So I try to live my life in such a way that I spend money in accordance with God's word, that I give generously, and that we save for our future. That's what the Bible talks to us about. Amen? We didn't deserve anything we've got, but in good conscience, we've put our hope and our trust in none other than Jesus Christ. So now let me shift it towards you. Or one more thing about me, and then we'll shift it towards you. Um... A guy recently challenged me in an area that, that kind of impacted me mentally big time. I think for much of my life, I prayed things like, Lord, I want to earn X amount of money per year. Lord, give me $100,000 per year. I want to earn $100,000 per year. And it was always kind of me focused, right? And he said, what if you change the way in which you pray and set a goal for how much you want to give? And I was like, what? What, what if you set your goal and started living like it now, giving it away generously? I want to give away a million dollars in my lifetime. And then you started to act that way, right? You just started to be generous. You started to give away 10% or more of your income. You started to live that way. Might God then entrust you that you would then earn $100,000 a year, so to speak? But you got to do it with the right motivation, right? I'm not just saying you flip it and say, oh, give so that I'll get the cash on the other side, right? No, I'm not saying that in any way. But he really impacted my heart with that thought because I think that's the way most of us pray is that, Lord, would you help me to get a certain amount of money, right? But what if we changed our thought process to say, Lord, I want to give away this much money in my lifetime and then start to live like it. How different might our finances be a year or two or six months from now later? I wanted to give you this preface about the church and my personal finances because I want to turn the tables on you. Yeah. I can do so in good conscience knowing that from what I've just said, there's no personal gain in it for me. The only reason I share it is because I believe it and I've lived it. And I believe that you are not just hurting yourself if you don't begin to apply these things, but also you're revealing something about yourself and your relationship with God. But if we would repent, if you'd start to live differently, man, God would move in your life in a big way. So first God goes after the priest. Now he turns his attention to all of us as believers. Remember again, these are his last words before going um, silent for 400 years until Jesus' return. Start in Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. It starts a lot the same ways in which he addressed the, the priest. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, O children of Jacob, you are not consumed. He tells us right you should be consumed for this you should be consumed for not living by these things that i'm about to tell you malachi 3 7 from the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them return to me and i will return to you says the lord of hosts but you say how shall we return we have not been keeping his statutes and it goes far beyond just money Christian statistics are no different. We fall right in line with the world. Our divorce rate is the same as the world's divorce rate. We still go on cussing and fussing. We're still going on lusting. We still go on spending our money on things that we shouldn't be doing. We give the time of our life to entertainment, to comfort, to all kinds of other things, but we don't give our time and attention to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, but we live in this model of insanity and we expect things to be different. Why y'all getting so quiet? On top of it, we prove to God that we don't love him because we don't trust him with money that he actually blessed us with in the first place and gave us the ability to earn. Malachi 3, 8. 
will a man rob God? Yet you're robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and in your contributions, you are cursed with a curse, for you are not ro- for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. So it started with the pastors and the priests. They were doing the wrong thing. They weren't teaching people how to live. Sadly, we still in many ways do the same thing in our own generation. But he's saying, you're still without excuse. You've got the Bible. You know what it says. You can keep on living the way that you're living or you can live in a different way, right? So by enslaving yourself and giving 10% to the debt collector, you're worshiping those things of the past and stealing your ability to worship the one true God. And we've all fallen into that trap, some on purpose, some by accident, right? We weren't taught right. But once you know, then it's our time to start to work differently to begin to get out of those holes, right? That might mean you might need a different cell phone or you might need a cell phone not as often as you do, right? That might mean you need to do some things differently. We've had people come in, give me benevolence. They come in with some beautiful hair the next day. They still rocking that cell phone that costs eight hundred and fifty dollars with a hundred and fifty dollar plan, but they ain't got fifty bucks to go start to change their life. That's the kind of stinking thinking that's infiltrated all of America, including the church. You know what? It stinks to cut off some of those things, but if you want to get free later and not keep paying the obligations of the past, then you need to do some things differently. Why are y'all being so quiet still? Like one person's like. It's a dead serious subject matter that we're dealing with. He's saying, do you want your finances to be cursed or do you want them to be blessed? Again, I'm not going to leave you with just give 10%. That's going to be your only solution. In the days ahead, I promise, during our offering time, I'm going to try to give you tips, tricks, help. How can we change the way that we think and view money and the way that we can get out of debt and be free? Because that's what really matters. Because once we're free in that area, then we can freely worship the King of Kings. You know, when I sold the business, I got a nice check. And I had to pay 36% of it to the IRS. 36%. That stunk, man. I mean, like, jeez, 36%. And then I had to give 10% to God. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, there was like a couple seconds where like, you know what I could do with that money? <laughs> How cool would that be? Thank God it only lasted a couple seconds. Because then my mind turned and I said, you know what? I would have never had any of this if you hadn't given me the ability to do it, if you hadn't put the clients in my path, if you hadn't put the faithful people around me, if you haven't given us wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. So with great joy, I wrote one of the biggest checks of my life to Journey Church, and it was like, yes, how awesome is that? Thank you, Lord. This is an act, an instrument of worship, and it doesn't matter the size of it because I felt the same way that first time I gave that $20 check. How amazing is that? When we truly worship him in that area, it does something to us. It changes something within us. Lord, thank you for changing our heart. Make this a joy to us, not a burden. It's not a tax. I hear sometimes in Christian circles, including from our own stage every now and then, you got to pay your tax, your tithe. No, it's not a tax. It's a joy. It's, man, thank you, Lord, for giving me the ability to earn resources. May I bless you for blessing me. Am I somebody special? Not at all. I applied biblical principles as an act of worship. I took God at his word. I read Malachi very simply, and I began to apply it in my life. And God always, always, always honors his word. Here's the final conditional promise that should bring you hope. Malachi 3.10. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there might be food in my house. Worship team, you can begin to come back up if you've not already started to do so. And thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open up the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. Now the lottery promises you that, but it doesn't deliver, right? God is faithful. It doesn't say he's going to supply every want that you have. He says, your needs will be taken care of. It says that he's going to protect your finances if you put this principle into practice. It says in verse 11, I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil and the vine of your field shall fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts, and all nations will call you blessed for you will be in a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. Let that sink in for a moment. 
your tires will last longer, so to speak. Your, your refrigerator will not break. You know, your roof will stay solid. It doesn't have to come in these ways that we think. And certainly it doesn't, the blessing does not have to come as an exchange of I give you a dollar, God, and you give me 10. It could be in some other area of blessing in your life. I'm not, I'm not a prosperity preacher. You think you've already noticed that from what I've said. Is this a topic in which you could rejoice? Or is this a topic that when I was sharing it has brought you stress pretty much the entire time I've been saying it? Are you living to give? Or have you been living to get? Are you living to keep paying the debts of the past? Or do you have freedom for your future? God uses sometimes these challenges to refine us. But do you want to keep living the same way if you're struggling in this area of your life? What if you begin to apply God's word? What if you begin to take him at it? This could be that moment for you. And I'm not saying you're going to go from zero to hundred and everything's going to be okay. Some of you have debts and other things that might seem insurmountable at this very moment. But what if you began to take baby steps and those baby steps begin to add up and a year from now, your financial situation was completely different. How would you feel? How excited would you be to walk in on Monday and say, I don't need your job anymore. I'm going to go get me the job that I've always wanted, right? How amazing would that be to have the freedom to write a tithe check and not worry about where your other finances are going to come from? How amazing would that be? We're not doing another offering here today. <laughs> I promise you that. I'm praying that God will stir something in our hearts. Would you rise with me and bow your heads and close your eyes? You know, the greatest need that all of us have is where I started. It's not salvation from a politician or from a preacher. It comes from a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the first and foremost starting point. In the context of today's studies, the way that we spend our money, the way that we give, the way that we allocate our resources does reveal something about our faith. His word is clear, it is true, I don't need to reiterate it, we all know it. Lord, in the days ahead, would you teach us how to be better stewards so that we can apply what we know, so that we can live free. So I would ask this today, nobody's looking around, and I'm not going to embarrass anybody, but man, I, I'd love to pray for a breakthrough in this area today. If this is a struggle in your life, not the tithing thing. Let's, let's eliminate tithing. I don't want you, you to think it's about that. If finances are something that's continually stressing you out, whether you have a small income by worldly standards or whether you have, you know, a $100,000 a year job or, you know, we, we were learning this week that the pastor was going to speak to some football players that earn $10 million a year and if they're without one paycheck, they're broke. This is not about how much you earn. If this is an area of stress in your life, if you've got debt in your life and you just don't know the answers to it and it's something that's constantly stressing you and you want freedom, I would love to pray for you. If that's you, would you do me a favor right where you're at? Nobody's looking around. Just raise your hand up real high if this is a true stress. There's a lot of hands in here, but I suspect there's probably more. I suspect there's probably more. I don't want to belabor it for some, um, you know, emotional purpose here, but man, if I know even up till this year, there was times in my life where, including now, I stress and worry about it. God, how are we going to pay the church's bills? How are we going to pay our own bills personally? It captivates much more of my thoughts, distracting me from true worship than I'd ever care to think. And if that's you and you just want to have that freedom, if you want to start a new way of life, you want to change your thinking, you want to begin to learn, if it's an area you need to repent, I'd ask you to just join me up here at the front. You could walk out of your seats right now. If that's you, just make your way out and we're going to pray and then we're going to sing and we're going to worship God in song and we're going to exalt his name for the hope that he brings. Thank you guys for coming up. I know there's all the rest of y'all finances are just perfect. I, man, we should have a million bucks in the bank. Come on, Jesus. Come on, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Maybe as they sing, feel free to come out of your seats. There's no shame in this, Lord. We thank you and praise you. We give you glory. Go ahead and sing, guys.
Communion tables are open to my right and my left. You can come kneel down as well. And at the you end, unravel we'll me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies to all my fears are gone. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child.
One more time with all your heart. And I'm no longer. It's beautiful. I am a child of God. Father, we've come to the end of our journey in the Old Testament. And I'm struck by many of the things that we've read along the way. We did see the seasons of the enslavement of the Jewish people, followed typically by repentance and then freedom. As you close out the epic chapters of the Old Testament, you drop a bomb on humanity. You first call out the priests and the ways that they're living and the things that they're teaching. And you call out all who call on your name and say, the way in which you're using your money is revealing where your heart is really at. Then you go silent. Maybe you're letting humanity think about it and ponder it and wonder. Giving them time to repent. Giving them time to turn from their ways. Father, today as we go home, would we take time to ponder and think about how our finances reflect our worship and love for you, but also the hope that comes because 400 years later, you gave the ultimate gift to all of mankind by sending your one and only begotten son to die a sinner's death in our place for our sins that we might have life. You gave freedom to all who would repent. And today we come to you in that spirit of repentance, remembering that you are God. That you're the one who brings hope. You're the one who brings freedom. Would you forgive us for falling into the systems of the world? The prince of the power of the air, the devil himself, has done such a good job of turning humanity into debt slaves. From a very young age, the corporations and the government conspire to steal our resources that we can't worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, would we not continue to fall into that trap? Would we change our thinking and change our ways and be excited about learning how to be good stewards? Would you change something in our heart or for those who are already there, reaffirm that which you're already doing and use them to help educate and coach others to do the same. Father, I truly believe with the amount of times that you speak on finances in your word that you just know that it's something that captivates and enslaves most. And Father, your will and your desire is that we would be set free. And Father, as you have called upon the priests to live right and repent, I come before you today in humble repentance and ask for your forgiveness for only preaching half of the truth. Lord, we've lived much, much of our ministry telling people what they should do, but not necessarily showing them how they could be set free. Father, repentance means turning from our ways and doing something differently. So, Lord, we pledge that from this day forward, we're going to do something differently. Because I truly believe it'll make a bigger impact than anything we can imagine in every area of life. Marriages will be restored. People will be set free. The kingdom of God will be advanced. And even as we're repenting as a church, I ask you to examine your own heart right now. Maybe you're like me and things have uh, seemingly gone, gone your way, but as I look at the way in which I spent my finances, even though I've not been in debt, I squandered way too many resources that could have been used for the future or to advance God's kingdom 
And man, I just have something within me that truly wants to live for him. And I bet you do too. So Lord, I pray you use this as a watershed moment for the people of Journey Church. That they would set their hope in you. Would words like the end of Malachi chapter 3 ring, ring true in our heart in the song that we just sang? We're no longer a slave to fear. We're no longer a slave to our finances. We're no longer a slave to the things of this world. We've surrendered our life to you. You are our God and King. You are the hope of the world. You're the one who came to set the captives free. Father, would you start that process right here, right now? And devil, you don't stand a chance in front of the people of Journey Church. We will walk in anointing. We will walk in power. We will walk in humility. We will walk in repentance. And we will see this city transformed by the power of the gospel for the glory of God and our generation. In Jesus' name. And everybody says, God bless you guys. Go have a great week. If you're new, come on up and say hello.